encounter these nasty spores that have a habit of appearing in the uh, in your dairy. We'll cover what spores basically are, um, a little bit of basics about uh, milk spoilage, um, where the spores actually come from and where they um, can be found within the, your uh, equipment, your systems, issues regarding biofilms um, and then some and methods and, uh, and ways of minimising spores um, you know, within your system and, uh, and the requirements for CIP. As, uh, when it comes to spores it's all about CIP. If you don't get that CIP right um, those spores will come back and they'll be um, very tenacious. Now, sperms are uh, actually, uh, they're, they're formed in particular bacterial types and they're, uh, it's, a, it's a basically a survival mechanism. So if it's excess heat or we start um, cleaning things with, you know, caustics and acids or using biocides, there's many bacteria can actually form spores as a, um, basically as a survival mechanism. They're, they're not, a, it's not like um, mushrooms that have spores that are used for, for, for um, growing and breeding and spreading. These are particularly um, just for uh, a survival instinct. And they're, they're very um, resilient to most uh, sanitizers. It's really the oxidative um, sanitizers that uh, are about the only things that will really get in and, and kill these spores. A lot of CIP and cleaning steps do not affect them. They'll, they'll come through um, you know, reasonable levels of, of caustic and acid without much um, problem. They can certainly um, tolerate quite high temperatures, uh, more, much more so than live bacteria. Um, they can tolerate extreme dryness, um, which makes uh, um, you know, which makes the, the problem of getting soils and those sorts of things, and, and particularly windy days where soils and things get blown in and around air conditioning systems. So you know that that is a source as well, um, and particularly they can be found um, anywhere you have biofilm, anywhere you've got soil deposits, which is why the CIP is just such an important part of the process. Um, a basic structure of a spore. I guess the 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 key the key part for the the spores that makes them so resilient is this um, uh, this exosporum part and the spore coat. These these coatings around the uh, uh, I guess the genetic material that's inside the spore cell make them very 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 resilient. And the way the spores work, the the, the spore actually uh, it uh, generates it, uh, you know, the the particular bacteria will actually generate and start to generate a uh, a spore within the, uh, the 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 body of the of the cell, and then it goes into a full blown spore. The rest of the cell dies away, and you're left with this very very active spore with this uh, really strong, very um, uh, protective. Uh, uh, coating on the outside, which makes them quite resilient, as I said, to or, um, the various kinds of sanitizers and, and caustics as well. Really, when it comes to milk, I mean, milk in the cow is um, it should be uh, should be sterile, um, and it can become, you know, as people know, it's uh, it can be contaminated with all types of microorganisms. Uh, but really, it's all that to do. Um, and I guess the quality of the milk, as everyone knows, you know, the health of the cow can come from farm workers, it can come from equipment in the farm, it can come from uh, uh, certainly the environment around the farm, what temperature the milk's held at, how long it's been at those holding times. And I guess when it comes to spores, um, the environment can have a, uh, a definite impact on the uh, number of spores that you get in, uh, in, in milk. Key for us for, uh, for for milk spoilage is the uh, the gram positive spore formers. Um, you know they, they, they tend to be the thermoduric bacteria that spore forms and causes most problem in in milk and raw milk. Um, uh, you know the, typically you know we get gram negative the the usual um, the usual uh, microbes within milk and you can also get some heat stable enzymes but uh, so today we're going to focus on these uh, thermoduri bacteria that can actually produce spores and typically uh, where we do, you know, where we've got something with, um, you know, a post pasteurization contamination, and you um, that that usually um, attacks shelf life and, and gets um, biologically active um, fairly quickly. So, you know, five to ten days, you'll start to see, uh, you know, bacterial contamination. But but what we find with um, um, gram positive spore formers is that uh, the spores remain stable for, for um, quite a number of days and it mightn't be until 15, 20 days before you actually realise that you've got um, spores in there and they start forming into the bacteria and then start growing. So there's quite a lag process in these um, spore forming 
um, bacteria and the and the spores you find. So it's it sometimes um, after the fact that you find you've got spores, it's also just just um, uh, analysing and trying to find uh, spores using bacteriological tests can take quite some time. So the key factors are for for shelf life for dairy products and is the and and these same factors will flow on for any, you know, the cheeses and and the, and the post products of, of dairy. Um, it's the, uh, you know, the clearly the uh, quality of the original milk coming in is is is, is uh, vastly critical. Pasteurisation, any sort of thermal processing, because we're talking about thermodurics, it's really critical that we um, we get those pasteurisation processes um, correct. Um, Factors such as post pasteurization or um, process contamination can uh, uh, do spores as well as uh, uh, the other micro uh, micro um, little bugs we get around the place. Sanitary design, very important um, one for this one, and regular sanitation. Uh, make sure that your your, your GMP um, uh, processes are, are in uh, in and working. Packaging, the way it gets packaged, the way it gets stored, storage and distribution. Um, do play a key role, as I said. With, with, if you do get spores in your system, it's often, you know, 15, 20 days later that you'll find out that you've got spore formers um, causing spoilage issues. So you need to understand your complete production sequence right from go to wire. It's you very much need to do this with um, spores. On the farm, um, you know, people look at somatic cell counts, and they, um, you know, they, they'll do the uh, micro tests and check those. Um, we've looked over a lot of data, at EcoLab, both here in New Zealand, lots and lots of data and work happened in uh, US and Europe, and there really is no correlation between somatic cell count, your standard um, uh, bug tests, and spore count. They're they're almost separate. Um, so it's you know that those uh, spore counts are very hard to um, uh, to fathom. Um, like it's soil is the major habitat for spore formers because they can form spores, they can tolerate dryness, they can survive in soil. So um, so that's an important one. Um, feed and environmental conditions can um, contaminate the other and teats. So if you've got a lot of um, um, spores in the soil or silage, those sorts of things. That's when you can get infection on the on the externals of the udders and the teats, and that's how it can um, get into the milk. So, um, so cross contamination from silage is, is is an important one, as I'm sure most people um, would, would understand. But but the, even the um, the amount of uh, spore formers in silage can vary depending on you know when it was cut and what sort of conditions it is, how wet it is. So you know it, it can it can vary. Uh, you know there's a factor there from 10 to the two, 10 to the six. So you know I mean that's a you know, uh, over a thousand fold difference between, uh, you know, something that's got some spores versus something that's got a lot. So that's, um, you know, that, that, that is a, a very important one. And I guess the, uh, the environmental conditions there, if, um, you know, milking days when it rains and you get splashed and mud everywhere, that makes things even worse, particularly if there's lots of silage around the place or if there's lots of um, spores in the soil. So, uh, so those environmental conditions uh, uh, can be quite critical. Um, dirty, poorly maintained milking equipment practices. Obviously, if you get spores in there, it's going to be worse. You've got to make sure that the um, CRP practices on farm, make sure your tankers are right, uh, clean well, all those sort of things. Even that, so there's a lot of that cleaning factors um, uh, are important even before you get uh, the milk on site. Um, spore counts can be quite random. Um, we've analysed um, a, a wide section of, of, of dairies and farms in the US and looked at trending as uh, you know are particular areas, particular farms, do they naturally trend high, trend low, and all our data indicates fairly random spore counts. Um, it's partly is the sampling um, because it can vary so much from you know, cow to cow, time to time, depending on the, you know when, when they're actually milking. Um, and it can vary from day to day. Again, it depends on moisture. How much, you know, was it windier? Was it was it um, was there rain? So we found no correlation for when you may or may not get cell, um, spore higher spore counts. Other than we know that when they, uh, farmers are using lots of silage, you definitely will get more um, spores forming. So uh, it's a really hard one to um, to try and work out when you're going to have high spores. 
within the actual dairy plants, um, any sort of processing steps operating around 45, 60 degrees C, because we're, um, it's the um, thermoduric bacterial um, spore form is the, the, our biggest problem. Uh, that they're going to be the danger temperatures. So um, we, we we need to make sure we uh, you know we limit those sorts of temperatures as best we can. Um, regeneration sections of pasteurizers um, certainly that that's one of the key spots that we will find spores and spore formers. Um, preheaters and evaporators after long runs. So around nine to uh, twelve hour runs. Uh, um, a bit later in the presentation, I'll show you some uh, uh, some examples of of, of the cell. Uh, you know spore counts over those periods of time. Um, any extended raw milk storage, um, so you know, if you need to maintain a, a quick turnaround of that more raw milk storage, not so much for spores, but this is for the actual um, spore forming bacteria, um, which then form spores um, a, a further along along your processes. Separators, that's a key spot for that we find spores. Um, again, highly soiled areas, lots of hiding places, um, and it's also a place where they actually get concentrated, so they can also come through that way. Um, holding tanks, again, turnaround time, don't keep filling things, empty, clean, and, and uh, start refilling is, is the best way to do those sorts of things. In general, in dairy plants, we find, um, you know, uh, when we've done our surveys, you know, 50% of, of micro spoilage is, is likely to occur at the filler, 30% in piping, and then 20% through to pasteurisation. Now, most people would be surprised that we get much in the way of um, contamination through pasteurisation, but most of the contamination, uh, uh, pasteurisation, even a pasteuriser that's working um, working properly, will most probably be spores. So, um, you know, there is uh, there is a, a significant um, uh, chance of getting uh, contamination there at the pasteurization phase. Um, typical uh, spoilage organisms, um, you know, if uh, if it's post pasteurization contamination, you will normally get spoilage, you know, in that 10 to 14 days. Uh, the bacteria there, they're active, they start growing uh, fairly uh, um, fairly quickly. Um, if you perform a, a stress test, and a stress test, uh, um, I'm not, I'm not the best microbiologist in the world, but the, the stress tests, as opposed to just a straight plate count, the stress tests allow um, further growth of more um, of microorganisms, so they can build up numbers. It just makes it a bit easier to be able to count some of the bacteria and that that are in uh, lower numbers. So a stress test allows much more growth, and you'll definitely get uh, growth in a, in a stress test in, in that sort in that sort of case. Often with that post pasteurization contamination, you may or may not get um, coliforms, but uh, more often than not, you will get coliforms. Most um, post pasteurization contamination, I reckon it's most probably 50 50 that it's, um, it'll be from uh, you know personal hygiene or um, or, the, or environmental or environmental contamination where you get coliforms. Uh, we're areas where you have spoilage after 18 plus days, um, they do tend to be the uh, gram positive uh, spore forming bacteria. Um, a stress test um, will often um, show no growth because. Uh, um, the, the, the way the stress test works to allow um, things to grow, it does allow a certain number of days for it to um, for it to grow, but the, the spores take longer than the stress test time to be able to show growth. So you often not see um, uh, or identify spores. And typically, um, coliform tests will be within specs. So uh, um, so these these gram positive. Um, um, bacteria and spores are very difficult. Um, there is actually some new technology just coming through that, we, uh, that we've seen and um, we know hopefully that it'll be uh, made commercially available during next year is, 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 the, is, is, the, is the hopeful one, but there is actually some spore forming um, identification uh, systems that are coming through. Um, they're just being researched and waiting for patents and what have you at the moment. We've, we've, we've been in conversation with people and uh, you can get spore um, identification within about five to six hours so that allows you to be able to at least um, you know do batches tankers those sorts of things so that, that'll be a, a nice little um, extra bit in our arsenal against spores once those things uh, come through um, typically um, biofilm issues are all important when it comes to spores because um, just like bacteria, the biofilms allow hiding places for for spores. Uh, 
Uh, normally when we think of biofilms, we think of a, a traditional biofilm where things haven't been cleaned properly and, and, the, uh, and the biomass stays um, you know, in, in little nooks and crannies and large patches and those sorts of things. Um, certainly you can get spores in those and bacteria in those, but they're often not an issue. I mean, we, we find um, spores and spore forming bacteria in very well um, CIP equipment and sanitized equipment that do not have normal biofilms. What we do find with uh, spores is that uh, um, just, here there is sort of residual soils can act as a hybrid biofilm and soil matrix. So you don't need much in the way of uh, of soil to be left behind for it to be able to be a, uh, a hiding place for spores. So, uh, so um, um, and I've got some pictures of just, just the sort of soils that you can pull out of something that you think that's even, that's been cleaned well and um, uh, and and you still get good quality um, uh, uh, product out of the out of the place. Um, any nooks and crannies, so gasket joints, valves, um, heat exchangers, evaporators. O-rings is another area. So uh, you know anywhere where, where small organisms can can hide, that's where you, you tend to find your um, your spores. Um, they'll, they'll hide in there. So low flow areas uh, are going to be key. I mean they're they're important for all bacterial. Um, and and I guess the other one is, is biofilms. Now you know you can get biofilms as a as a problem because you're not cleaning. You can just get natural biofilms that form during the um, production runs. Um, so it's be you know be aware of those. So I mean, all these factors that are on here, I mean, I'm sure that's everything that people look for for CIP. But once we start looking at spores, they become even more important, and even the smallest uh, amount of these issues can cause yourself a problem. Um, the typical difficult um, places to find in and uh, I've got a good picture in we found um, spores in 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 one of these um, o-rings in there which although we talk about things uh, lots of uh, you know micro in, and and spores and those sorts of things in o-rings you know, when it comes to a, a simple micro test when people are doing just um, you know plate counts and what have you there's not a lot of uh, bacteria in there but the spores will still retain in there and you don't find them through typical um, um, plate testing um, uh, the, the the picture on the lower left there um, yep yeah, that was a typical thread sampling point that uh, we've also found um, spores in there so you know they find small um, Small hiding places um, to seed and uh, and and survive um, places where perhaps the numbers of live bacteria are extremely low and may not be of concern for live bacteria or a plate count. They're nevertheless a um, very good hiding place uh, and a place where you will find spores and spore formers. And during CIPs, um, you know, we all we talk about the CIPs having our time, our temperature, our concentrations. Um, mechanical energy in there. You've got to be really careful with with temperatures as well, because uh, the, uh, the the critical spore formers for us are thermodurics, uh, and you know they they can survive in that 45 up to 60 degree area. If we don't our CIPs correctly and don't get our temperatures right, we are uh, first thing we do is we breed lots and lots of these, or we have perfect conditions for these microorganisms to breed. Then we sort of hit them with the caustics, and they form uh, uh, they um, just you know form them uh, spores as, as a bit of protection. So this is a this is a, an infrared photo of a of, of the tea piece. That's the photo of it in um, normal uh, normal light on the on the right hand side. You can see. Um, during CIP, this is after flowing the, water, you know, the, the hot water, water of um, 65 degrees, flowing through it for a, for a few minutes. There is a lot of areas in that T junction because of the the mass of uh, metal and those sorts of things and the flow conditions. There's lots of areas that are high in, uh, in uh, the, the yellow colours of the higher temperature. Plenty there that are a lot um, lower temperatures around that 40 degree mark. So you've got to be a little bit careful when you when you're doing CIP. Make sure everything does get up to temperature. Don't rush your CIPs. It's all it's all about getting up to temperature, then doing a countdown, rather than um, uh, doing a countdown and then getting up to temperature. So profiles critical during CIP. Make sure we have, have maximum effect for uh, uh, for these spore formers. Um, heat exchangers. 
all these plate heat exchanges and uh, anywhere where there's fine nooks and crannies and channels like this, you know, you can get a lot of uh, soil built up on these surfaces. Some of that soil will um, will actually stay there. I, I'm sure people have seen these um, plate heat exchanges pulled apart. And even though you can clean them, you can get good plate counts. You don't get any um, adverse quality issues from uh, you know, that dark part particles and those things coming out. Invariably, when you pull these things apart, you will find soils in there because uh, some of these protonaceous soils will actually um, burn on and almost form a, a plastic coat. It may not fall off and discolour your product, but it nevertheless does um, provide habitat or a hiding place, I should say, for uh, spores. Um, traditionally, I mean, heat exchanges are difficult to fully clean. Um, we clean them as best as we can, typically, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, Use our quality uh, use our quality control checks to make sure that they're okay. Um, it is difficult to confirm proper clean. We can't open these things up because um, it's it takes hours to, to um, open them up and shut them and then we, we, you know redo them again. Um, build up. That's where they can breed. So if you do get thermophiles in there, that's where they'll breed. If they slough off and go further into, further into the Shit. They really start to build up. Looks like a few people have lost. We've got them all back again. Rob, it's Jenny oh, it's here. Jenny I'm losing here. sound, but all good. So just continue. I'll I'll continue on anyway. All right then. Now I guess the key one is is that it's going to be difficult for us to stop uh, spores and spores. Um, you know, meters and meters of piping, lots and lots of different equipment. You want to try and keep your your equipment, your piping, um, um, you know, to your absolute uh, minimum as you can. Um, need to minimise milk residence time at, at those temperatures that favour thermophilic spore formers. So that's around that 60, 70 sort of uh, zone. You want to
the product you're making, so, um, um, tolerance for, uh, for spores, and certainly with you know, nutritional products, uh, you've really got to um, keep those production runs to nine to twelve hours as best you, as best you can, because that's when we start to see the uh, the spores and the spore formers start to um, build up. The negative of all this is that it limits your productivity and that, that can be a little bit of a problem and it's a matter of working productivity versus the value add of low spore products. So this, this is where it actually can become viable. Um, the other option is for long production um, times. If, if uh, you can actually um, you know, isolate, so your first uh, nine to 12 hours you can use where the guy got low spore content, low, you use that for your high quality product. The rest, um, the, the rest of the production run, maybe the rest of the 20 up to 20 hours or so, there for the, they can be for the, a, a different uh, micro-grade um, product. So that, that's one way of doing it. Certainly in the, in the US, a lot of people do this. They'll, they'll, they'll do a long run, but it'll only be the first um, eight, nine hours will actually go into the high quality products. The rest will be standard grade. Um, don't store product in holding tanks or, those, or um, for any long periods of time. Once you've got spores in there and the potential of uh, generating spore forming bacteria, you do not want it to hang around for very long because they, they will increase in numbers quite rapidly. Um, don't run pasteurizers for extended periods. Um, a lot of people making uh, these high quality products with very low spore counts, they'll have um, tandem um, pasteurizer systems. So they'll run one and then they'll, they'll switch between these the, the two pasteurizers. Um, the other thing to consider is intermediate CIPs. This is, this is a really good one. Not so much for um, bringing the, um, the equipment back into um, uh, absolute perfect condition, but they, they do help to reduce the amount of uh, biofilm formed during the CIP. It um, reduces the amount of soils during the CIP, and you can sometimes get uh, uh, the, the the opportunity to uh, you know to get slightly longer run times. Uh, this is this is a typical of a uh, of a of a UHT production. Uh, so they'll do lots of uh, you know intermediate aseptic cleans. They'll they'll do those as a as a regular basis. Um, the other thing you can do is to install um, back diffusers. Um, there's several uh, dairy plants uh, around in Australia will have. Um, back diffusers, uh, basically they're just a, a different style of, of separator, but they're designed to be able to separate um, bacteria out of the system. So this becomes a, a secondary, um, uh, a secondary uh, microbial in intervention. Now with, um, with CIP programs, we have to make sure that obviously all the CIP parameters are correct and maintain over the length of the uh, CIP. Uh, one of the problems I see when I'm out in the field and we, when, we do, when we're doing our work is that uh, you know, temperature control of CIPs is often not all that good. Um, they'll be up and down all over the place, or, or um, so you know, we've got to make sure we get those correct uh, CRP parameters for the correct amount of time, get those temperatures correct. Um, it's best to use um, what we call a, a built product, so, so products that have uh, you know, all the surfactants, wetting agents, those sorts of things. They will clean significantly better when it comes to spore formers versus just using the, um, the, the commodity um, sodium hydroxide. Uh, commodity sodium hydroxide, it cleans uh, more by a sort of a chemical interaction rather than wetting and, and we do tend to find in um, just sodium hydroxide cleaning alone with no wetting agents that we do get more, um, you know, small areas, small corners and build-ups of, uh, of, um, of, of caustics, of, of those of soils that can actually um, uh, contain spores. They're building up or it's an issue. You may have, you, you definitely will have to hit your CIPs a little bit um, higher than normal. Um, certainly consider more frequent CIPs. Um, given the knowledge that uh, you know, your, your spore formers do start to um, really show their presence after about you know 10 hours or so, that you know perhaps you should consider you know doing your CIPs at that point in time unless you want to uh, split off your your, your production. Uh, consider intermediate CIPs. If you do have a long process, your, your process um, requires you know, um, a 20-hour runs. 
you may have to do an intermediate CIP at that 10 hour front in order to get as much um, soils out and then continue, um, and then continue production. Um, an intermediate CIP can be turned around in uh, about half an hour or so rather than maybe you know, two hours or something for a full CIP. One of the critical ones for, um, um, for uh, spore formers and spores it's per acid sanitizers. The um, use, using any um, you know, acidonics, even heat sanitation, uh, doesn't really doesn't really um, uh, kill them very well. It's the per acid sanitizers because they're um, oxidative, they're highly reactive. They will actually um, attack that outer coating of the um, of the spore, and it will actually break that down and kill the spore that way. Most other sanitizers, quats, for example. Few people use quats these days, but quats will have no effect on, on on spores at all. So you've got to use these sort of oxidative per acid type sanitizers. They're absolutely um, absolutely essential for that. So for in order to uh, you know get our spore count as low as uh, as, as possible, we've uh, you know we we find that most of the people that do it, this is exactly what they do. They do use premium cleaning chemistry, so they will use uh, products that do have high levels of wetting agent that are very good at removing um, burn on soils, those sorts of things. Um, you can either use the built products, you can use additives to add to the caustic, which are uh, most probably less expensive. Um, a lot of people will use the um, per acid override programs or um, acid um, uh, caustic override programs. Uh, most people just do a straight caustic wash. I have an example of that a little bit later on. And key is the validated timing CIPs, where people um, uh, have low spore counts, keeping them low for that product value. They will have a set time that they're validated between CIPs for all their pieces of equipment right through the whole system, depending on what they're doing. So, uh, you know, we, we have customers that. Uh, Make um, nutraceutical powders, for example. They're very they're, they're very strict on the time between washings for pasteurizers, back diffuse, the lines that supply up to membranes. Very strict um, uh, production runs on membranes, evaporator right through to dryer. Very very strict. So that that's important. They spend a lot of time making sure that those validated runs um, are correct, and they do get. Um, very good um, um, product out the end. Extremely low, uh, extremely low um, uh, spore counts. Uh, per acid sanitizing under under sort of hot conditions. Uh, typically, when people do uh, might use a chemical sanitation with a with a per acid, for example, it's normally at ambient temperatures. And look, and for most micro issues, not a problem. But when it comes to really, um, I guess, to get the lowest possible spore counts you you really want. We start to look at uh, per acid sanitizing under warm to hot. So uh, around 40 degrees is, is a typical typical one. Uh, depending on your systems, uh, we do have some customers where we do it up to 80. Around 40 gives a it gives a significant improvement. Um, sanitizers will need to be used in all areas: membranes, evaporators, and pasteurizers. Um, you, you've really got to be on top of these spores. They are uh, they are tenacious little buggers. That's for sure. Um, oxidizing detergent pretreatment is the key. is the, is one of the best ways in which you're going to uh, uh, clean your your systems um, for all critical equipment. So um, you can use that on on all the stainless steel equipment. Wouldn't use it in membranes, but you can use it in all your stainless steel. So you know, particularly your separators, pasteurizers. That loop becomes um, quite um, critical. Back diffuse if you have them also um, are quite critical in there. So uh, it, it then they not only help to um, break and um, kill the spores themselves, but they make sure that you get the best clean you possibly can. Um, caustic overrides and and caustic wash um, that style, which is the um, that uh, sort of pretreatment type process, is definitely the way to um, to go at the removal of soils. Um, a standard acid wash. Uh, now the, the acid washes don't have significant impact um, on on spore counts unless you do have high buildups of um, 
you know, the, the um, calcium deposits, the milk stones. So, uh, so your, 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 your acid wash requirement will depend on how what your buildup of uh, milk stone is. So uh, some processes, um, some of the more critical processes, they'll do an acid step anyway. Some, some areas where it takes a while to build up, they might only do an acid wash at the end of the week. It's, it's more about removing that, um, the high levels of organic um, soils out of your system. If you don't have a lot of calcium in there, there's not a lot of calcium issue, you can get away with um, uh, not doing acid every single time, but make sure you validate. Um, per acid sanitation, um, using warm, uh, in warm conditions, uh, has a much better uh, sanitizing effect. So um, existing uh, premium products are uh, generally used in new ways. So you know, when, when we do the, the full wash programs, we, we will use that on separators, through preheaters, pasteurizers, um, and certainly use that in, uh, in evaporators. A lot of people uh, you know, don't realize just how dirty some um, types of evaporators um, can be. And using these uh, full wash programs uh, to eliminate as much soil and uh, residual films as possible is the best way to go. Um, usually pretreatment programs are not used on um, non-heat exchange uh, equipment. They're, they're often used on things we know like the pasteurizers, preheaters that might get a bit of um, organic buildup. But we find that you still need to use these things even through um, supply piping from you know, from you know, a post pasteurizing holding tank to the next process. So you do have to um, get in there and make sure that you you clean every little uh, every bit of uh, uh, remaining soil, every hiding place as best as you as you can. Um, typically, sanitizers are not used in pasteurizers and evaporators because they do run at quite high temperatures for normal micro levels and standard plate counts. But we're not talking about standard plate counts. We're talking about getting those spore counts as low as possible and you have to start using sanitizers in those uh, in those applications. Uh, per acid sanitizers circulated at you know warm to hot temperatures, that's the best way. Usually it's not um, single pass doesn't really work. Often often a single pass um, sanitizer it just flushes through and might only have a minute or so contact time. You really need something like you know five ten minutes contact time. So again, uh, you know we'll, we'll, you need to validate that, but you're looking at um, you know five to five to ten minutes. So you're looking at uh, um, a, a recirculation time rather than a, a once through. Um, saves on the saves on the uh, using up a lot of sanitizer, but you've got to be able, you have to have the ability to be able to put your um, uh, sanitizer in a recirc loop. There's, there's no there's no reason to have that once through for cleanliness, as long as it's on that loop and the sanitizer is there, it'll do its job and they get a good contact time. Um, if you are using um, a per acid pretreatments, um, you, know, you need to follow um, any sort of uh, Recommendations from suppliers need to be followed very carefully. Um, you've got to be careful about the type of per acid, peroxide type products that, that, that can be used. Um, temperature profiles are also very critical because we're, we're using something that can release oxygen at heat. We've got to be a little bit careful about the type of equipment and the uh, and the temperatures. Um, and, and it varies a, a, uh, quite a bit. You know, um, 70 to 80 degrees for pasteurizers in UHTs, where, uh, where you have high heat um, sections up to 140 degrees or so. Um, you can use per acid treatments through there. We have just got to be uh, a bit understand that uh, you know the, the times, concentrations, those sorts of things. Um, temperature profiles are critical. I mean, just as the as, as um, um, product is uh, you know during the product um, manufacturing processes. We've got to make sure if we want a temperature that we hit that temperature, we maintain times for those uh, those temperature profiles. Um, overall CIP times it, usually not increased. Uh, the, the, these pretreatment programs can still um, fit within a, a normal um, CIP um, uh, normal CIP program. So uh, there's there's no need for you know extension of times on, on on these sorts of things. In fact, in some cases we can even uh, decrease our cleaning time depending on uh, uh, depending on what uh, what you actually do, um, caustic products. Um, only certain caustic products uh, can be used. Um, definitely no EDTA based products. Um, EDTA is a uh, is an additive that they put into um, a lot of caustic cleaners to help remove calcium out of the system. Um, 
doing these um, paracid peroxide pretreatment processes with EDTA products will cause blackening and discoloration of stainless steel. It doesn't cause, um, it looks really weird, it doesn't actually cause any damage to stainless steel, it doesn't really cause any bug harborages, those sorts of things. It just looks really ugly black and it's very difficult to remove when it does occur. So, uh, um, so the caustic base products have to be um, either the, the pro pre-mixed product or an additive has to be suitable. And usually they're um, surfactant gluconate based products. So, uh, um, and you can get additives that uh, prevent this uh, blackening process as well. Um, sanitizers, uh, mixed paracid sanitizers definitely show superior activity. Um, a typic, typical sanitizer that's out there these days is, um, is, a, is a peracetic acid. So it's, uh, and much as they're very good for um, to, uh, your normal plank out, plank out type um, bacteria, they do not have the, the, the really good punch against uh, spores. So, uh, so mixed peracids are, are based on uh, on acids other than acetic acids, so octanoic, nonanoic acids, there's new series of acids um, uh, uh, coming through that are actually based on, um, on sulfur-based acids as well. So that's a new technology that's going through. And they're always best used at higher temperatures. So uh, you certainly get significantly um, better efficacy at 40 degrees than you do at, uh, say, ambient 20 degrees. Uh, and often when you do CIPs, the whole system is, um, is, is hot anyway, and a lot of people can spend time um, waiting and cooling down their system so they can do a sanitized step. In actual fact, you can uh, leave your system uh, and you know, maintain that at around that 30, 40 degrees and get a bit of uh, additional activity of that sanitizer. Now, when we've, uh, we've we've done a bit of trials through um, bringing some of our US counterparts up to speed, I, I must say, then Australia, New Zealand, uh, we have some of the uh, the lower spore count products that are being exported, and uh, there's a lot of people around the world want to get on our coattails and start producing lower spore counts. So we've been doing lots of trials and getting lots of new data over in the US, and this is typical for um, um, what that we see. There's a um, this is a product coming out of an evaporator and final product out of powder. You will notice that uh, you know, it's, you know, this, the spore counts of ordinarily before when they're doing standard CIP processes, those spore counts rapidly um, start coming up after about 10 hours. So it, it's, it's, this is a matter of the more spores you have, the faster that they'll, they'll, they'll breed. It's, it's typical. Uh, where we do use these, um, these, these programs with the per acid pretreatments, we can hold that off for several more hours. So, you know, we can almost get an extra five hours run time. And that is big dollars when you're talking, um, uh, you know, extra cost, um, you know, price for products. Um, in the powders, we find the same thing. Basically, it's, you know, it's almost half the level of, um, of spore counts when you use these, uh, these um, uh, more comprehensive CIP programs. Uh, again, uh, another, another another customer. It's, it's, this this is a good one because it's uh, the, this trial was done on a different day and, and then the trial the spore counts just happen to be a little bit higher that day, that day. But by using these products and this this is a, a more concise uh, t uh, time frame. But uh, you know, as long as we clean out all that um, all that system, make sure that the whole month that uh, you know we get out, get rid of as many um, spores and spore formers as we possibly can. That stays low for that uh, you know certainly under that uh, 15 hour mark. Whereas you know where, where there is residual spores in plus more spores coming into the system, it rapidly increased, and it reflects significantly in the powdered product. You know um, they were most probably only able to sell this uh, you know. Um, you know, only the first few hours or so of this product uh, under normal conditions, whereas un under the extreme, that those those uh, longer, uh, more impressive CIP um, cleaning regimes, they get much uh, much lower spore counts. And this is the sort of thing that we uh, that we see. This is um, this is soil that was removed out of the uh, out of a, a, a heat section of a um, of a uh, pasteurizer. Now this pasteurizer has been running fine, good micro results, no um, no black specks and things. So all your quality uh, 
um, cycle was good. But once we started doing these pre-treatment programs, really hitting the soil, we really started to move bits and pieces out there that were um, in all the little nooks and crannies. So this, this was actually emptied out of one of the um, inline filters, which is why it looks a little bit lumpier than it actually is. So um, you know, typically where we change over to these sorts of systems, that's the sort of soil we see that, uh, that hasn't been removed. It's almost in a way it's been like stagnant soil that's just been hiding in corners and not actually having a, uh, a uh, an active uh, uh, micro input, but it has had an active spore um, input into, into, into the product. Um, with, uh, I mentioned about the, the various kinds of uh, sanitizers, you know, um, where we have uh, mixed mixed peracetic acid, so say a, a mixed or mixture of um, of the um, um, acetic acids, peroctanoic acids, uh, you get very good results, but you do need about um, you know a minimum sort of um, you know five uh, minutes uh, contact time, and they really do start to work. Where we have a um, combination of a per acid and a per acid cleaning program, we find that some of that um, the spore the spores have already been attacked during that cleaning process, so you know it acts uh, in part as a um, you know, as a uh, an, in an intervention that acts as a, a biocide during the cleaning program. So when it comes to uh, um, doing a doing a normal clean, you actually get quite good results and, um, and spore counts getting very low during the actual cleaning process. Uh, I mentioned about uh, some experimental, there's experimental per acids which are based on, uh, on sulfonic acids. They're, they're even better than the, the mixed per acids. So uh, those, those products are, are coming online in, over the next year. So there, there's a, a lot of work in this. There's a, a lot of people have been asking for intervention programs Biocides that are very specific towards um, spores. Now, this is typical of a, of a deep clean um, a CRP program where we're trying to eliminate spores as best we can. Um, you know, we we, um, we have a pretreatment program, and what it is is normally in this section here with, with pretreatment alkali, you would just do a um, uh, you know an alkali a caustic wash using a caustic product. And it must probably run anywhere from you know 40 minutes, 30 minutes, or, or so up up to up to an hour, depending on what you what you're trying to clean. What you do with these pretreatment programs is you split that into um, one third of your time. You actually circulate with these um, um, with these per acid um, peroxide um, uh, products, and then you override it with um, with caustic for the other two thirds of the time. So your total actually your actual total time spent on this, these sort of sub steps is, is basically the same as you are currently doing for CIP. So we're not extending any time. Um, we have found that um, you know, we, we had customers that are doing very long caustic CIP times in an attempt to try and clean it. We can actually reduce down the times because you know, this override combination uh, becomes a very effective way of cleaning and a very fast way of cleaning as well. Acid washes, as I, as I mentioned before, it's totally dependent on your buildup of, of calciums. For really critical um, pieces of equipment, you'd most probably still do it, and you might only do, um, you know, maybe only 10 to 15 minutes um, in, in the non-critical areas. And usually with acid, because a lot of people clean with uh, um, with nitric acid, um, yeah, I, I don't like uh, nitric acid getting uh, getting too hot. Um, some people will clean it at the same temperatures as uh, as the alkali. If you start cleaning up, you know, above 70, getting towards 80 degrees, those acid cleaners will start to attack, um, you know, rubber gaskets and those sorts of things. Um, when you finish off your CIP, sanitize with a, a mix per acid, and you'll be you know you'll be using around 0.1, 0.2% um, per acid. Again, depends on just what your buildup of uh, spore formers is. Um, maybe maybe 10, 20 minutes. Again, it's 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 you know this this temperature and time. The temperature and time is dependent on just how much of a problem you've got, how much how much of uh, you know um, uh, problem you have in um, uh, you know the way you work. So just a bit of a, a bit of a summary is that um, you know really you need to understand what your incoming product quality is. Um, if you can, 
segregate good quality from um, the, the, the lower grade uh, products if, if, you're, if you're aiming for your, your um, very low spore count products. Otherwise, uh, um, you've got to use that product and then uh, make sure that you clean out all the spores because they do build up. So, you know, you're going to seed your, um, you're going to seed your equipment and your plant with uh, that incoming product. Um, limit long production time, so we're, we're keeping those um, spore forming bacteria, um, the, the generation and, and I guess breeding of those down to an absolute minimum. So you're looking at around 10 hours uh, long production runs before a clean in order to make sure that you keep your uh, spores and spore formers to an absolute minimum. Um, if you do have spores present in your system, you've really got to retrace your process. Um, in situations where we found high spore counts suddenly appearing in powder that used to be um, used to be um, very good, you know, we'll run back through the whole the whole system. We'll retrace, see what's happening. Is is it coming from the evaporator into a powder? Is it coming from the from the membranes? And typically, what we find is that the ultimate source is pasteurizer. It normally goes all the way back to um, pasteurise. If you don't get that right, you don't clean that right, it's going to seed through everywhere and just constantly multiply from there. So, uh, so retrace your steps, have a very good look at, uh, at your pasteuriser and your cleaning process, right up that front end of your system. Um, look for any biofilms, residual soils, even the small patches of residual soils, and they are very difficult to see within your pasteuriser. Maintain very high levels of CIPs, critical. Um, use quality chemicals. We want, we want additives in, we've got to wet out those soils, we've got to move the spores out of the system. Um, we need to use deep cleaning processes to eliminate those soils and get them out of the system. They're the, even small areas of soils, hiding places for spores and spore formers, and we need to use um, per acid sanitizers. All right, I've had, uh, had a few uh, questions come through, um, and I'll just look through those questions. Yes, we had the question regarding what, what uh, sanitizers we, we use for um, killing spores. Yes, um, I, 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 it's definitely the uh, per acid sanitizers are the way to kill the spores. Anionics, um, heat sanitation won't cut the mustard as well as a, a per acid. Preferably mixed per acids are the way to go. Um, um, another question there is um, why do CRP cleaning steps um, don't affect the spore formers? Uh, they actually, the CRP cleaning steps do actually affect the bacteria, but as a response to being in the presence of CRP cleaners, they form the spores, and it's the spores that are resistant. So, in, in it's a bit strange, but in one way, you, you, you're killing one form of the um, organism to produce another form that is more resilient, and that's that's part of the problem. And then they become resilient to all sorts of uh, cleaning processes after that one. Um, as far as uh, confirming, uh, there's a question here, how can you confirm the cleaning of heat exchangers? Uh, very, very difficult. It, it depends on the type of heat exchanger. Um, if, if they're, if they're, they're, they're tube, uh, if it, you know, it's a tubular heat exchanger, or and, and this also goes for holding tubes as well. Um, yeah, you can actually get in there. They're a little lot more simpler to be able to get in there um, and open them up and have a look. I mean, you might want to want to do it every time, but you may want to do it uh, over a validation uh, uh, as a validation sequence. Within plate heat exchangers, um, they become more difficult because uh, they must probably only get opened up once a year or something. So uh, when they do get opened up, I um, I certainly expect quality people. Uh, and the, you know the, the quality managers to be down there watching every single thing just to see how much soil there can be in a, uh, a plate heat exchanger. You can't open them up to have a look. You're, you're relying on, I guess most people rely on um, you know just simple swab counts, or they rely on uh, the possibility that you know the, the the brown soil specs coming through into product as as a test of clean. That most probably tells you that you've got loose soils, but it doesn't uh, let you know that you've got some quite tenacious sort of um, protein bound onto the surface. Um, uh, I've got a question here about the uh, the stress test. Yeah, the, the, the stress test I use for milk is is where you've got certain organisms at very low levels, 
they perform these stress tests where they allow the, the microbes to um, grow into higher levels and then uh, I guess they sort of type them and, and separate them out. Uh, simple plate counts will often miss um, some uh, microbes that are in very low levels, which is why um, some people do the stress test. Not, not a common test, but, it, um, but we, we certainly um, did it in some of these trials where we were trying to find out you know, every kind of organism that we had in there. And because some of the spore formers were quite low, we had to use these uh, stress tests to try and breed them up a bit. All right, um, uh, another question here. Um, what effect does high spore counts have on product quality of milk powders? Again, it's um, when it comes to milk powders, um, a lot of, uh, Different people will have different specification milk powders and the price that customers pay for milk powders will often be um, aligned to the lowest micro specs. So, uh, you know, um, so uh, you know, a, a very low spore count powder can most probably earn you 10 times the amount as a standard milk powder, a, a commodity type skim milk powder. Um, because, because the the lower the lower uh, micro spore count products can be used in nutraceuticals, very highly value added, really really wanted in China. So uh, and, and and a critical um, uh, sales tool for into Japan as well. So so spore counts are one of the key pricing indicators uh, for those value add products, low spore count powders uh, for export. And I've had another uh, question here about uh, um, interested in getting some further information about um, the rapid, rapid spore tests. Yes, um, at the moment uh, the, the information we have is, is just on, on sort of I guess it's it's EcoLab talking with universities and it's um, and they're very much pilot testing at this stage, but um, the commercialisation will most probably happen uh, hopefully uh, next year. Because um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it as much as anyone else. So as soon as it does, um, I will certainly let people know. And I, I, I'd imagine there'd be uh, no doubt some article in the uh, in the dairy magazines about it as well when it does come through. But I'm expecting sometime next year.